We're in Berlin at the third annual INSEAD Healthcare Alumni Summit, and our next guest is Bernard Munoz. He is the founder and the chief apostle of InnoThink. Bernard, thank you very much for being with us here on INSEAD Knowledge. Welcome. Thanks for having me. You've spent 30 years as a sales executive and an advisor in corporate strategy for Eli Lilly. Today, you're a bit of a radical. In fact, you're even advocating outsourcing research and development. What are people saying about this? Well, uh, we, we need to address some uh, problems in the industry that are, um, you know, verging on, on crisis. Uh, one of them is that uh, we are not producing enough innovation. Uh, we are roughly, the industry is roughly producing 20 to 25 new drugs a year. Most of those are only marginally ineff effective. And uh, public companies are spending $125 billion a year on research. And that does not include NIH, universities, foreign governments, private foundation, and so forth. If you add it all up, uh, society, because society ultimately pays the bill, society spends in excess of $200 billion a year for 20 to 25 new drugs, which frankly are not no longer all that good. What's wrong with the business model today in pharmaceuticals? It's been very effective uh, since the end of, of World War II, uh, but every business model uh, eventually runs out of steam, uh, and that's, uh, that lifespan is oftentimes determined by uh, new technology, by development in the marketplace, uh, by you know, various factors. Uh, and it looks like the very long run that we've had in the uh, pharmaceutical industry is coming uh, to an end. Uh, the model that has served us, the industry so well for several decades uh, is no longer seems to be working, uh, no longer seems to be able to deliver the breakthrough innovation at a cost that's affordable. Uh, so you know, things need to change. Uh, and Clayton Christensen, you know, whose book have been very popular, uh, is right. Uh, whenever industries get into this predicament, uh, they're ripe for disruption. And disruption always comes from the backwater areas of the markets that are neglected by the majors. And in our industry, this basically means rare disease, neglected diseases, and biodefense. This is where you have uh, people who are who don't have the resources to play the game the way the game has traditionally been played, but who are passionate about what they're doing. You know, helping people who uh, you know, cannot afford the treatments uh, or, or don't have access to innovation, uh, or in the case of governments, you know, finding, um, uh, cap developing a capability to come up with uh, you know, treatments uh, in case of a strike uh, you know, within weeks, not within 10 years. Society is sending messages that we are no longer willing to foot the bill. So how do you propose selecting R&D projects? It sounds as though you want to be immediately profitable. No, not, not really. I, I think uh, you need direction. Uh, and uh, each company you know, is free to set uh, their area of focus uh, wherever they feel comfortable for historical or other reason. Uh, so they may decide that they're going to be in diabetes, so they're going to be in neuroscience, so they're going to be in anti-infectives or in cardiovascular drugs, and that's all fine. I mean, CEOs you know, have uh, the prerogative to, to set those, those, those areas, but they, they should stop there and they should let the scientists decide what the solution to those problems are going to be. Uh, I mean, we've seen recently some excesses of, of planning uh, that have been very destructive of innovation, where you know, the CEO, the industry, or the, the commercial division will go to the payers and ask the payers, you know, what sort of drug are you willing to pay for? And so they come up with a profile, and then they take that profile and give it to the scientist and say, go ahead, make it. When I joined the industry 30 years ago, there was not a lot of operating procedures, not our processes, but there were some very strong principles. One of which is that new employees were pretty soon taken apart and told, don't ever do anything that will embarrass this company. Even if it's legal, we don't care. We don't want to be on, on the front page of the newspaper. That was a very powerful compass that each employee could use to drive their behavior. Over the last 30 years, we moved away from those principles and replaced them with a mishmash of hundreds and hundreds of procedures. Frankly, no one knows what there is there. You know, we've gone a long way from the 90s 
when Merck was voted most admired companies seven years in a row. And we need to basically get back to that. Uh, so, you know, regaining our credibility with regulators, with patients, with physicians, uh, and, you know, stop being listed in the newspaper as the companies that has been, you know, fined most heavily uh, of all industries, as, it, as we've seen recently, that, that really doesn't help. Second thing is that we need to recreate an innovation culture. You know, R&D in the pharmaceutical industry used to be driven by creativity. Today, it's driven by process. And process is very destructive of, uh, of R&D. You know, managing a pharmaceutical company is a delicate balancing act between, on one hand, um, you know, the order and the discipline and the alignments uh, and the rigor uh, uh, that you need to manage the big bureaucracy. On the other hand, you also need, uh, you know, vision and ability to make decision without a lot of data and orthogonal thinking and fuzzy processes and the ability to cross boundaries, uh, which is the hallmark of creative organization. So you need to balance those two things, you know, discipline on one hand and lack of discipline really on the other. And uh, the, the founding fathers who built the industry, you know, the George Merck and Eli Lilly and Wallace Abbott of this world were scientists and they understood those tension and their answer to that problem is, well, let's create independent research organization. Let's create Lilly Research Lab and Merck Research Lab and Bristol Myers Pharmaceutical Research Institute. And those are basically states within the states where scientists can, can, can do science unfettered. You point to the Defense Advanced Research Projects, which gave us GPS and night sensors. What's so good about this funding model? Yes, th this is a fascinating, uh, a fascinating uh, organization because, um, you know, DARPA, which is the innovation engine of the U.S. military, uh, is uh, by, by any measure uh, the most innovative uh, research engine that was ever designed. Now, that the biggest bureaucracy on earth, mm -hmm. the U.S. military, could spawn, you know, the most creative innovation engine is a bit of a paradox in itself. Uh, but they did that 50 years ago uh, when, when the Sputnik uh, you know, went in, up in the air and, and the U.S. military was caught by surprise. And then they did a little introspection and realized that uh, if you look at the past, you know, all of the defense program that produced weapons uh, that, uh, that, that, that eventually made a difference, uh, none of those weapons that really made a difference came as a result of the programs that were organized and managed uh, in order to produce them. Uh, they came from you know, somewhere else. Uh, and so they, they basically came to the conclusion that in large organization, short-term priorities will always tip the scales towards marginal innovation at the expense of major change. And those organizations that rely on major change for the survival, therefore, need a different model. And uh, so they created DARPA. Uh, not, I can't believe that at the time they really knew what they were doing. Uh, but it turned out that they were doing the right thing. They only have two levels of hierarchy. They have the program managers, which are those mad scientists. And then you got a few bosses. Uh, and that's it. They're empowered to take whatever decision they want. They are, you know, the, 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 the leaders of DARPA can hire whomever they want at any time, pay whatever it takes without having to refer to anyone. I mean, we met them once. I mean, if you're a bright scientist with a wild idea that can change the world, you go, them, you go to them and explain to them uh, what, what you're doing. The first question you will get is, is this disruptive and why? Because by law, they can only fund disruptive stuff. Now, if we ask the same question in a pharmaceutical industry, is this disrupt drug disruptive or not? Is it going to change therapy or not? And if we apply the same discipline, we would save ourselves tens of billions of dollars a year of funding drugs that ultimately aren't going to make a difference. What evidence do you have that people are actually listening to you? I think that the industry is basically 
clustering into different buckets. I think you've got companies who've realized that you know, we're in for major disruption, and as long as we're gonna have to go through that, we might as soon you know, use it to our advantage and disrupt you know, the rest of the industry uh, as we're disrupting ourselves. Uh, it's tough uh, pass to, to, to hoe, uh, but I think some companies, uh, major ones, have come to the conclusion are, and, and are embarking in the direction. Um, and then you've got some companies who would like to protect you know, what they've been doing all along, that even, even though it hasn't been working very well. Um, I, I am skeptical that you know, this will succeed and, and, and eventually you know, they're gonna have to face the, the music. How do you see the future of pharmaceuticals in the next decade or so? Do you see this unwinding? This is a bipolar industry in many ways, uh, in which you've got you know, a big club, I mean a club of big pharmaceutical companies on one hand, and then you've got an enormous population of small companies that you find you know, in West Europe, in the US, in, in emerging markets, of companies who supplied quite a few drugs, but do it uh, you know, in a way that, that really is not very profitable, is not very innovative. Uh, so you've got those two uh, attractors, so to speak, uh, for good reasons. Uh, so we're gonna have big pharma now, and we're gonna have it in the future, and we're gonna have you know, those population of those small companies as well. But I think the membership will change. Um, I, you know, those companies that uh, have embraced transformation uh, with resolve, you know, the Novartis of this world, you know, the Genentech, which really was all about innovation in the first place, um, and, and, you know, Sanofi, GSK are trying to do, to, 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 to make, uh, doing some very interesting things in this area. I think those companies uh, have a greater chance of being there 10 years from now than, than the others. Uh, so we're gonna have a, a, a big club, uh, but, uh, I don't think the membership will be the same. I wouldn't be surprised, frankly, if 50% of the big pharma that we have today no longer exist in, in, in 10 years from now. I think you've got companies such as Novartis, which has become the most innovative company industry since they were created in 1996, uh, but they've been, they, they, they got there by embracing a focus on breakthroughs, not by embracing a focus on blockbusters like the rest of the industry we're gonna see a number of big pharma basically disappearing for lack of innovation. And then we're gonna see uh, the insurgents, uh, to, to go back to a theme of this meeting, uh, companies who are small, but very hungry, very creative, and they realize that you know, they can embrace that disruption to their advantage. They can use innovation network to produce, to increase their innovation and do it on a shoestring. Uh, and they're willing to take you know, a risk uh, on doing it because they've got nothing to lose. They may be $600 million right now. Um, if, if they play it safe, uh, you know, there'll be a billion dollars in 10 years. Uh, um, if they really take a risk, uh, you know, there could be $20 billion. Bernard Munoz, thank you very much for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thanks for having me.